Welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hello there. Hi. Thanks for hanging out and chatting with me. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. We're going to talk about something super fun. We are. How to use jealousy and envy as individuation material. Right. They're not, Who doesn't like that? They're not just for panic and angst. <laughs> they're not just for pleasure anymore. Wait. Okay. Okay. What are jealousy and envy for? What are jealousy and envy? Okay. Well, you asked the right person. I, I did. love that I question. Did ask the, right, the right person. Okay. So, first, I have a reason for wanting to talk about jealousy and envy as individuation material. That reason is actually pretty straightforward. It's that they're good at it. Jealousy and envy are two different emotions, though we typically conflate them in popular, like, you know, when we're just chatting. Um, they do get conflated, but jealousy and envy, let's just let's just get some definitions out there. Um, we can think of jealousy very simply as a triadic situation where I'm fearing the interruption of my connection to someone I that I value, right? So a triad because I fear that interruption by another person. Um, so when I say a triadic connection, I mean three people. Envy, I mean, there can be an interruption, a fear of, of loss could be happening, um, but it's really more of a fear of not having it's a longing envy is about a longing oh, it's the dyadic okay. it's about me wanting to i long to be what you are or to have what you have yeah hey i want that yeah and while other feelings may come on the heels of that like resentment or feelings of judgment or whatever well, here's the thing. You can be jealous and envious. In fact, ah. jealousy can absolutely have a component of envy in it. it. Okay. Um, the reason I I like to sort these things out is so that we can make sense of them and so we can figure out what to do with them once we are aware that we're feeling them. So if you're jealous, let's say I have a connection to a beloved other. Let me say it's you in this instance. And I fear that that connection is going to be broken because someone else is going to um, interrupt our connection through literally interrupting, like, like diverting your attention away from me. So I have less of your time or less of your focus. Um, at the same time that I might fear that interruption, I absolutely might be comparing myself to that third person, that perceived interrupter, Oh, comparing okay. myself negatively or comparing myself and just comparing them in the positive, right? As having more or being more. And now I've got a double whammy because now not only may I be feeling jealous, that fear and, um, and maybe anger and sadness and grief because jealousy is a complex emotion filled with other emotions about the interruption, like the fear that I will lose what I have, but I may also imagine that I lack something. Envy is about lacking. Oh, you know, we talked about this, you know, offline a uh, bunch. And I think that's the first time I really got what, what you're saying about the um, losing versus wanting. Yeah. Like losing versus feeling a lack. Those are two very different things. So cool. not not everybody conceptualizes of je jealousy and envy this way. This, um, a really strong argument is made for this in, um, oh, goodness, Oh, I will link it in the notes. Um, there's a philosophical argument about the, the separation, the distinction between jealousy and envy that I find particularly strong. And Onan, ah, Prasari, maybe? I imagine it will come to you before we finish you. recording. But I will put the link in the notes because it's a strong argument and not everyone needs the argument. <laughs> not everybody will care so much about this distinction. But since I care so much about individuation, about really um, actively participating in knowing what is me and what is not me, well, jealousy and envy, because we just talked about how they invite this feeling, envy invites this feeling of comparison, 
jealousy invites this feeling of of awareness that we are we are separate and oh, we yeah, could be interrupted okay. right mm -hmm. so that that interrupts my any um feelings of codependence and sameness and unity and oneness that I might have right so in both cases jealousy and envy there is the opportunity to leverage that for individuation I mean I get it it's not the most comfortable well yeah um jealousy is scary I mean it is it is fear like it's the fear of of, of, of a loss of a, of a change and that's uncomfortable yeah so jealousy is it, it is um it can be categorized as a fear-based emotion which just the tip of the iceberg yeah. the complexity that it is right and there and and under that is so much complexity because jealousy can it it really is best thought of as this emotion that sort of it contains obscures is made of other emotions and the two biggest that show up in the research are fear and anger okay it matters to me that it's fear and anger because those two emotions they have a lot of information there's a lot of intel if i'm getting in touch with my fear and my anger i am probably closer to the parts of me that have been exiled the parts of me that i don't want to look at the parts of me i am afraid are not worthy or will not get attention right so this is why i find jealousy to be a really profoundly useful emotion to move toward instead of away from so what i heard you just say is that one of one of the values of jealousy is how close you can get to some of the parts that you might have pushed aside to yourself keep from you from yourself yeah. yeah oh yeah that's nice and from what you said before about individuation about understanding what's you and what's not you well that sounds very useful do you struggle with that i do so i, yes, do, I do i don't in no way when i point out that you can struggle with these things i i do so only to give people an opportunity to hear from from both of our perspectives i don't in any way mean to insinuate that i am somehow individuated or done or even further along the path but i know you well we've been doing this work for a while and i know some of the tender spots that mm -hmm. you might not think mm -hmm. to volunteer yeah right so i'm going to invite you to talk about this because you have struggled quite a lot with knowing where the line is between you and other mm -hmm. I have. which is i do i do i'm gonna yeah. so i want you to talk about it but I, i'll point this out too it's from my perspective it, it's particularly ironic because you have over the course of your life i've known you my whole life i always thought of you as kind of an island a more isolated person a more unto himself person so from the outside you appeared very autonomous very separate very much not the codependent over connected type and then I married you. <laughs> I put on a good show. It was very much of a bait and switch situation. Uh, yeah, I spent I most, I spent most of my life leading up to <clears throat> leading up to really um, starting this relationship with you. Um, absolutely living into what you just described, a fairly, I think of as standard masculine story. Yeah. Of, self-sufficiency separateness and i mean i know there are lots of masculine people out there who are very community oriented and uh, so a western connected. patriarchal a western patriarchal so like a isolation caricature yep. of man not yeah. not the masculine principle at all not the masculine principle um i still we, struggle we'll with do a whole masculine principle myself of understanding it and so i took on this um culturally provided uh costume mm. and i lived into it hard well, i think it had one of those plastic masks oh and yeah the old 70s time that kind of yeah. hurt right here yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um yeah so uh you're right I came across as very isolated but then when you got to me it turned out that my ability to understand connection and the difference between me and you is kind of weak uh to I, understand it to understand it yeah 
And so my experience of that was that you you made these um, these grand sweeps into my system, like you sort of you moved into my my yeah. being, mm -hmm. and I found that really overwhelmingly attractive, especially in the early days. But even now, when you move into my system, I often feel it as really yummy. And then, and then, and then I don't move away again. <laughs> well, well, actually, what ha what I experience mm. is that you start to try to be like me or yep. be me. Yeah. Yeah. You start to mask who you are. Yes. Yep. And this took years and years for me to really understand that you were doing it. I had felt it with other people and I had felt myself do it. But I had quite the golden image of who you were. And so I didn't. You were given one. I was you given mean, You were handed one by lots of people. But I accepted it. And you I accepted it. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that. The loss I was experiencing when you would would just like come into my system and overlap me so entirely that it yeah it felt good it was sort of um like like being drunk feels good it felt really good but I stopped knowing who you were I stopped getting to enjoy right. you as other and different and that was that went on for a long time. Like years, yeah. on the order of years and years, um, and before I, an analyst told you to knock that yeah, shit yeah. off. And he, and he was right. Uh, in in just about and, those words. And it has taken, I mean, I'm still working on it. I'm still working on knocking it off. I don't do it 100%. I will still well, move in either. and connect to you. So, right, I move in. I, I uh, align myself up. I align myself with your you. And that feels good to you. It does. And then I lean away from the me. And that doesn't feel good and to me. It doesn't feel good because but, then there's no, then you're alone. But right? it can be tempting to some parts of me. Because okay, but you Same but what? you just said you just okay. said, and then I'm alone. Yeah, it does. It feels really lonely. It feels really lonely. Let yet you're there. You are all the time. It's weird, and. And I know that we, I know that we uh, we're talking about jealousy and envy in this episode and the indiv individuation material, and it it is all related to what we're talking about right now because that space that I do when I don't make it one of the first ways that I really heard you saying to me, um, you know, this is pretty codependent. This isn't really good for us. And you had said these things, and like it felt too good for me to fully hear it. And then you painted the picture that worked really well for me of if I'm in your system so completely that there's no one outside the system, then you don't have support. All you have is a coattail riding. Um, uh, okay, this is a parasite. I just move in and I hang out. And I kind of just be there. So, so you look around and you don't see anybody outside your system. Yeah. Because I'm all, all in it. And that was one of the first things that I heard. It's like, wait a minute. Right. I'm trying to get in there. One of the things that I like to do in our relationship is be supportive of the things that you're doing and of, of the life that you're building. That you're great at. But not if I am completely subsumed by you. You can't get support yeah. if I'm sitting where you are. I need to be out here. We can't standing. ride a unicycle. Right. Together. Let's not right. do that. I appreciate you naming that because it's been a while since we've been locked in that much enmeshment. Yay. Mm -hmm. And yet the feeling of loneliness, it comes up, it pings, it resonates. Um Sometimes I'll see tinges of it. And I did recently, um, it, we were just spending a lot of physical time together because there was no place to go during the renovation project and felt some of that yep. come up. Yep. And so the reason, <laughs> the reason all of this is coming out, I think, during the jealousy and envy conversation we're having is because, well, my primary academic research area is jealousy. Um, followed very closely by non-monopoly. Um, but jealousy 
is one of the ways and, and playing in the space of jealousy, playing in the mm -hmm. imaginal mm -hmm. realm, playing with jealousy in safe um, ways that don't harm others has been one of the ways that I have differentiated myself from you in the face of your demands, your un unconscious, unspoken demands that I enmesh with you. Right. Yeah. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I really had no idea. It was years of research that made me aware that one of the things I do with jealousy is start to notice that there's separation between us. Because in order for me to be jealous, um, that our connection will be interrupted, I have to allow the triangle to exist. I have to allow space, space between for us. there to be three points on that mm -hmm. triangle. Right. And therefore, I am me and you become the autonomous other, truly other. And without the other, I, there is no me. I mean, and <laughs> my spiritual yeah. studies lead me to a place where I'm like, yeah. And there's a really beautiful, pure place where I can also imagine into, yeah, there is no difference. We are one, not from a codependent place, but from a unity of the universe sort of way, right? So I think this is a great moment for both and. I am a mm -hmm. fan of the idea that there is no self and there is no anything, right? There's There just is no thingness, right? And at the same time, as an embodied existence, right, a, a spark that exists here, the only way I get a chance to access my consciousness is by interacting with other, capital O, other. Yep. And starting to sort me from other. That both and, yeah. It's a very wave particle duality thing. Same more. Right? Once, yeah. once upon a time, everything was particles. You know, eventually, at first it was so the white man the and then thought. rocks. <laughs> right. So the white man thought once upon a time, the European intelligentsia were like okay we figured it out it's all little bits bouncing against each other and we figured it all out except for that stuff which we don't understand and eventually somebody was like but i want to understand that and they looked at it and they said oh it's not that simple there aren't just it's not just a universe of individual little bits everything's all connected together at a level that we have been unable to see up until now and now we we inferred it, and then we start to be able to see it a little bit, and all of a sudden we develop tools, we develop technology, more tools to, to be understand able to it, yep, see to it, interpret understand it, it. Mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden, oh, okay, so an electron is is a, a thing, and it's a wave. What do we do about that? Well, we can do a lot of things with it from a technological point of view, from like a a making things happen physically point of view, but it also informs our philosophy and our psychology. Oh, yeah. look, as above, so below. We yeah. look around at the universe and we see reflections of our own psychology of, oh, wait, I am myself, autonomous, separate, unique, and also merged with everything everywhere. Yeah. Pretty cool. I... <laughs> I really appreciate your your ability to see through the psychology that I bring into the physics um, because they're not different. They are not they're, different. They're different. They are they are different lenses through which to look at the same realities, the same you know, like waves and particles. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. I love that. People love it, and, and that you know. is for me the knowing that jealousy could be both painful and a source of misery, actual misery, mm -hmm. because I could be caught in this terror, not let's go past fear, right into terror, where I am lost in the pain that we will be separated, that I will lose this valuable, beloved other, that I will lose the, the us, and at the same time, become aware that by having that space and engaging with that part of me that is so afraid, so terrified, well, that isn't all of me. That part of me 
is really important for me to know. Yeah. But really hard for me to know because that part of me is, well, I mean, she might still be five years old and lost separate from everyone. She's that part of me might be a, a, a disowned part of my consciousness that I just cannot bear to see. Those are hard to talk to. Yeah. So there are there are a bunch of ways that we could conceptualize about these parts of ourselves. Um, listeners might be you like you might be most familiar with it. Um, currently, the hot way to talk about this is internal family systems, um, IFS therapy, uh, parts work, right? But we could talk about these these parts of ourselves in so many ways. We could use Jungian theory and talk about complexes. We can use um, object relations theory. We can. There are so many different ways. What's important to me is that each person simply understands the world from a lens of multiplicity, right? Like starts making sense of the world from a place that allows you to truly understand yourself as multiple at, and also as a unified whole. Like yeah, the lens of multiplicity allows and actually sort of insists upon that, right? The, the unified whole isn't the antithesis of it. I don't have to, I don't have to write off that idea. I can, I can strive toward wholeness and, and a sense of self, capital S self, at the same time, because the whole is part of the parts and the parts is part of the whole. So <laughs> yeah. we're back around, like every, yeah. every sentence I feel like is bringing us back around. Okay, so let's get back to the yucky stuff self. Yes, so. The feelings of jealousy and envy. When you feel jealousy or and or envy, because mm -hmm. they might come mm -hmm. packaged together, yay, jealousy is yay. gonna come, it, like it's got a whole bunch of feelings with it, right? And it's gonna be a unique little cocktail for you. What's your most common pattern for jealousy to show up? Like, how does it show up for you? How do you recognize it? I'm still struggling to recognize it, but I'm, I'm starting to make some progress because for me, jealousy is um, it's very sneaky. It camouflages as other things. Um, Including in your language, right? Oh, yeah. I know yeah, this just because you hardly ever, hardly I mean, ever it years people jealousy. mentioned mm -hmm. it. Because it, I've heard lots of other people say this, like, I don't feel jealousy. And I, honestly, I would, I would, you know, categorize how to log my emotional responses. And I just, I couldn't find jealousy in there. It's like, I do a lot of things. I have a lot of, you know, feeling experiences and I can't think of where jealousy falls into that. Now I, I do have some clear memories of what jealousy felt like when I was like a teenager. I felt it there. It's like, oh, that's scary. And I wish that she wasn't talking to him. This is the most yeah. common thing at the time because I didn't know that I was actually just as jealous that he was talking to her. You know, I had my own sexuality Your was, was not my clearness was not evident back then. But I had those feelings. Well, to you. To me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, and, and then it just sort of fizzled. And I think the reason it fizzled, that, that sense, is that I would get too close. I would merge myself too much right. for there to be space for me to believe that there was a separateness that could be threatened. Say it again for the people in the back, because yeah. people work with me all the time and swear to me that they have no jealousy. And this is one of the ways that I see it show up clinically. Like I see it show up. There it is. I can, I can observe it in the data that is being shared with me. This is one of the places it's hiding. Yes, I I shield myself from the potential of experiencing jealousy. And recognizing it and naming and recognizing it. Recognizing it and naming it and then using it for the individuation, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, yeah. but we'll get there. Um, shield myself from it by imagining a way, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that the space between us doesn't exist. Yeah. And therefore, there isn't anything that could interrupt, which has many logical and practical problems with it. But as an internal 
standpoint, I can make it self-consistent enough that I can be like, no, I don't feel jealous because you can't leave. I mean, <laughs> it's more complicated than that by a lot, but you can't leave because I've I have subsumed you or I have subsumed myself into you. Yeah, either way. So where, how are you going to break that? That's like, my, I mean, there are ways, but from my point of view, it's like, no, that, that can't happen. Right, and let's just say, from the outside, you never look like that. You, like, you, um, we had a prenuptial agreement that allowed me an immense amount of freedom in all of the ways. Um, it, we had a, uh, a clear understanding, like all of your verbal mm -hmm. talk allowed for there to be space and separateness. So what you're talking about is actually really deeply personal, um, private it ways is. that you were conceiving of this particular relationship that you were yep. in. Um, and I just want to like say, first off, thank you for sharing it because that's really vulnerable material. But also, I want to like note the growth that I see there because you could absolutely look like the evolved guy, <laughs> right? Well, like I worked a long time like to you said look things. like the evolved guy. I didn't do much of the stuff that would have gotten me close to that, but I did. I worked on that veneer. Okay, but here's the thing. The individuation work is in not not having done that. It's in noticing mm -hmm. and then being able to look at that self, that part of you, that piece of you who was so frightened or, frightened or overwhelmed. Frightened is a good word. Frightened, overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, Very unconfortable. Or unknowledgeable, lacking skills. Mm -hmm. um, being able to look at that part and recollect that part. Like go go and get that part of you. Really yes. recollect that part That's and it, make exactly. it part of you again. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted let to say, that part in. Let that part in. Yes. You brought to me um the concept of my counsel. Like who's in there? Who has a voice in your internal life and you know gets to have a uh, a, a say in what happens? And when I was able to invite this part who didn't feel empowered to just say, I want this. Mm -hmm. So he snuck and he and he mm -hmm. he uh, he cajoled and he manipulated and he didn't take direct act direct but action. He's running the show. He was running the show. Yeah. And when I invited him in to the council to have a voice and speak. Then I was able to speak because I couldn't say this two years ago at most. I couldn't really say this because that part wasn't apparent to me, despite doing so much behind the scenes. So the image that you just shared to, is very vivid to me and a very vivid and clear image that I've heard other people share about jealousy. So. Um, the, the the simple way that I introduced the idea that we all have we all have parts, whatever you want to call them, but we all have these um, these fragmented or partial or um, less well integrated and understood mm -hmm. parts of ourselves, right? Um, in the Jungian sense, we all have these complexes. These they're autonomous. They have this quality of fully aliveness, and the way you know that is. They will grab the mic and run the show yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you'll find yourself saying something like, well, I wasn't like me at all, or I cannot live with myself. Mm -hmm. Who exactly are you talking about? Yeah. Right. So yeah. those phrases are a tip off that we are multiple. We are inherently multiple. Cool. I found that intellectually a stimulating idea, but um, emotionally and spiritually very unsatisfying. And so the image that worked for me when I was really struggling with this, especially um, at the beginning of grad school, when everybody was talking about these, these, um, these complexes and these, these autonomous complexes that are running the show, and I would get really overwhelmed. And what came to me was we have been doing a lot of work around rites of passage mm -hmm. with lots of kids. And so we would take them through some 
um, rites of passage that we were trying to create to help them move through the stages of life. And I realized that the image, the, the one thing that was really, really clear to me about the, any rite of passage that we designed was that there would be a fire and that we would come around it. We would join in a circle in some way around it. And that goes back to uh, before I even had my kids. Like there was something about that. And I think a lot of us resonate with this idea of a circle around the fire. And so I use the image of an inner council um, around, uh, and, and some people I work with don't choose like a campfire. Some people choose like a radiant source, whatever. Um, but I find that this is helpful because often when we start talking about the self and, and like getting into self leadership or um, individuating and, and coming into connection to the divine, there's this ascension. There's this idea of like, I got to find the highest part of myself, the best part of myself. I don't find that a terribly helpful mental construct for inviting in the parts of me that have been dislocated, have been abandoned, yeah. have been hurt. So instead, I, I use this fire circle image for myself, um, and I, I let the fire hold the center. The fire is the center, and the fire is connected to the divine, and the fire is me too. Like, this is very much a particle and wave situation here it's a both and the fire is me but the fire also doesn't it doesn't need to intellectualize it doesn't need to um it doesn't need to run off it, it just is but i can invite into this warm welcome circle um yeah any anyone in, anyone in here who needs to talk and over time more of me becomes available to take their place there. And over time, some of those parts become really integrated. And now I can access them as sources of wisdom. And dealing with my jealousy, when you were married to someone else and I was living with you and I was just working from this position where I had very clearly, I was, I was um, a secondary partner and I had accepted that, but I was struggling with it. Um, it was an invitation to start doing this, whether I knew it or not, to start being present to, okay, these, there are just parts of me that can, cannot bear this pain, this pain yeah. that we are separate and that our connection can be interrupted by someone else. Even though, even though, even though I had agreed to it all, even though I wanted it in so many ways. The jealousy, the pain of it, the intensity of it is what made it possible for me to slow down enough to just have to be present. It does call attention to itself. Yeah. It, it, it has a, um, it, it claims its space. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I think about the envy piece, when I, that's the, that's been the harder part for me. Um, to recognize, and maybe that's why you're just hearing it now, um, as individuation material, envy, well, um, fair. So our, our beloved analyst who has passed on now, Fair Green, said, looked me right in the eye one day and he said, so why are you studying jealousy instead of envy? Envy is a bigger problem. And I was like, well, I, don't, I just don't see it that way. Tell me more. And he said, well, envy is a wound to the self. And I stopped and I tried to, I tried to feel into that, but I got nowhere. So instead I thunk into it <laughs> um, as I was wont to do. And there often would call me out on, but we intellectualized about it for a while. And what he said to me is, so envy is about lack, right? But it's not about, I just, I lack this thing. I mean, you, sure we can envy. I could envy someone's Tesla. I could envy someone's new iPhone, right? I could envy that, I could envy your job, but if I can also envy who you are, mm -hmm. um, I envied you a ton right at the outset. And before there was an us at all, I envied who you were. You were stronger. You were taller. You had this like this, this aura about you where people just took you seriously. <laughs> and nobody took me seriously. Much, much you. Everyone should be, crazy. Yes. Yeah. And that envy. Um, as Thayer put it to me, was actually my invitation 
to understand the part of the parts of me I was disowning, like like where I was imagining there was lack. First yeah, off, like right. go recollect those. Am I am, am I less than? Like, do I lack these qualities, or do I imagine I lack, lack these qualities? The first couple of years of our relationship were a whirlwind of discovering. Well, so you golden shadow, projection. golden shadow. You imagined so much to be true about me that I completely accepted those because they were great things for my book because they were things I wanted to be. Um, brilliant and observant, brilliant and, and observant, and, and fast thinker and, and clever and. Um, and some of those things I sometimes am, but you weren't seeing my stuff. You're seeing yours. Reflected on, off look. of a beautiful mirror, but I was seeing everything I wished but you were, I was. Yeah, wished you wished were. I could accept about myself. That yes, that's it. It's it feels like wishing wishing you were that. And what it turned out to be was wishing you could accept that that's what you already were. That that is not easy, and there's, and there's a, a lot of pain in all that time of untangling. Oh, that's not me. That's you. And there was this gross, swampy passage to go through in order to recollect yeah. those, to to go collect those parts of me back up, those aspects of my being. Yeah, and and to own the ones that weren't aren't me like maybe I do have some pieces. Like you have a brain that works a certain way with math. And the way that it works, and there's a certain um, like facileness, like you, you can just turn numbers over in your head in a way that I don't, even though conceptually I do understand math, the numbers just don't turn over that way. Accepting that was actually like envying in you this mathness, right? And then accepting that my mathness is different from yours. Yeah. And then moving into excitement at what my mathness is. Yes. Right? Like it's yep. this process. And it, I swear, it just happens over and over and over again. And it happened with our physicality as well. Mm -hmm. First, you were faster than me. Then I got faster than you, like physically running. Yep. And then you got faster than me again. And there was this, this game I was playing internally as I envied your ability, your natural capacity to to move physically in the world. And I envied it and I got mad at you. I got so damn angry. And every time I got angry, I forgot to appreciate who I actually am. Yeah. And I was through the iPhone. I forgot to appreciate this embodied human I am. Yeah. There's material. You want some material? There's material. And um, I see there my, my understanding of what Thayer said about the wound to the self. You're denying these pieces of you. You're, den you're, you're cutting off pieces of yourself and saying, that's not me, when in fact it is. And I, um, the re-acceptance of those pieces is painful in a very confusing way. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. Thank like, goodness, I, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> and it really, this, I hate accepting this wonderful, amazing gift that I thought wasn't mine. Why is it so hard? Maybe that's another episode. Well, we, we could do a whole episode on that, and I think we should. And, but I can give a good example. Mm. Um, and I've seen this in a bunch of clients as well as in myself. There are parts of me that I disowned in order to become specifically, in order to become who my father wanted me to be. Ah. So to redigest those parts, to bring them in and integrate them and own them is to stand up to my internal father. My father's dead. To stand up though to the internal father who exists in my imagination, in my soul, and say, I am this. And if that means that you don't love me, then so be it. Now, my actual father, though he was kind of an ass, would not have said that. Right. But you're but my, imaginal on the one inside. Right. And so I, you have this like existential dissonance. Yeah. And that's uncomfortable. Yep. I am this. I am this. And I and cut that part off to try to make myself acceptable to you so that you would love me. And so I'm oh, taking no. it back. And now what's going to happen with them? Uh oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's this is juicy fine. stuff. So yeah. 
when we say um, individuation material, this is what we're talking about. It is, it is about gathering to you the the muck, the mud um, that contains your you-ness, all, all of you. Yeah. And also, um, therefore, inherently, puts you in touch with all that is. And gathering that material, I guess we could just, we could just go out into the world and gather it. But at least the people here who live here in our general world, right? Like we live in this very commercialized, mechanical, intellectualizing world, you and I. Yeah. Um, we can just spiritually by bypass like anything we don't actually want to digest. So the idea of inviting <laughs> this icky material in, right? And then and then working with it. Working with it meaning um, bringing it to my analyst, bringing it to a, a, a depth coach, bringing it to you because we have agreed to be individuation partners, which means you will at times look right at me and say, I see, I see that you really don't want to work with this. Does that mean it's time to? Because yeah. that's really all you can do is it all, yeah. you can just remind me of my own commitment. It's not your job to do the work for me. But finding the material, we're not going to find it in only looking at light. I mean, that's no. a great Jung quote. I mean, we could put the exact quote up, but you know, we, we don't make the unconscious conscious by focusing only on the light. We have to look into the shadows. We have to look at the messes. I've been a little obsessed with messes for a very long time because it's just such a miraculous way to come alive. Well, so for. I I came into your your world. We started to share emotional space and I watched how you interact with the world and how you dive into the messes. And that was not the life that I lived prior to you. Not at all. I liked puzzles. That's not the same thing. At yeah, all. it isn't the intellectual the gratification of solving a problem is not the same as standing in an emotional mess and turmoil and making my way through it until some of the turmoil starts to make sense and have a place to live. That's the transmutation. Yeah. So to use the alchemical metaphor, you, you put the material into the vessel, into you. You, you allow it in. You, um, <laughs> you heat the vessel by allowing yourself to feel, sit with the emotional content, be in it. And, and you, you stay in patience with it. That's you as alchemist, staying patiently with that. And me as Soror, I can be other to you and be... It's the other to the alchemist that you are and vice versa and just be patient that's critical while some part of that muck reveals gold yeah some and part. some parts of it stay mucky uh -huh. it's some not parts like, of that muck reveals muck right and and some part, parts of it just aren't ready to be worked with yet yep i have i have parts i have this material this like gross sticky, gnarly stuff all around my father complex that I have been working on for, I mean, actively working on in therapy, analysis, in so many other realms as well for over 25 years. Um, yeah, this is- This is a long term. As far as I know, this is part of my lifelong mm -hmm. process. And as long as I can stay patient to the fact that that's it. That's the point. <laughs> that's yeah. okay because the point isn't to solve it. My father complex is not for me to solve, nor is it my father's fault. Yeah. 
It's mm -hmm. not going away. It's all, because it's also it's archetypal and it's collective. It's bigger than that. So as I work on it, as I be patient with that work, the same goes for jealousy and envy. As I am patient to my work with jealousy, to me, my, my managing isn't quite the word. There are management strategies. We can talk about that. That's a very practical aspect of dealing with jealousy. But the individuation part of it is about being present to the struggle and allowing it to change. Yeah. It occurs to Not me. staying stuck. Yeah. Letting it change. Letting it change. I'm much better at this than I was years ago. Letting that be true and letting it also come back up and bite me in the ass next week. Yep. It occurs to me to say that I've been sitting here thinking about everything you've been saying and shame. I have like I have shame, oh, you have shame people, heat? all kinds of things. And the room's I, getting hotter. I don't, get don't shame currently heat. have shame heat, but I was remembering when you were talking about the uh, the alchemical vessel and the, the heat applied. Well, it's physically active. That happens to me physically. But I was thinking, well, there's a part of me that would like never to feel that again. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I am going to continue to be committed to a, a life and a relationship of individuation, that's not on the table. I have to be open to these, these, um, these really uncomfortable situations that I will create myself. I'll yeah. make them. And then if I have the because your so, soul's got its own purpose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if I have a fortitude to stand in those moments and not run away from them, then there's an opportunity for more individuation, to be more me, to find more of the me that's in me and call it into that council and be able to have that voice clear in me. And that's just one small practical aspect of doing it. So another way I see people hide from the the material the the gift that jealousy and envy are is by um it, it's your, well it's the the bypassing that you were describing before like i no nope, i don't see it i don't see yeah. it that's one way another is to stay stuck in it and to identify so wholly with your jealousy in particular jealous i i rarely hear anyone in fact i'm not sure i've ever heard anyone say i'm a really envious person I just covet all day long. I am just, no, I just, I, I want don't all. I think I've ever heard that either. I yeah. Never heard it. No, you know, please let me know if that's you because I'm, I'm intrigued. But jealousy, I hear people say all the time, I'm just a jealous person. And they skip the work that way um, by identifying wholly with it. Now they've actually, instead of, obscuring it by pushing away this part, right? They instead become the part. They become identified with this complex. And when we become identified with the complex, we can actually go totally grandiose with it. We can actually emerge, merge into this, this autonomous part of us, this jealous, jealous one, the jealous one. Let's call them um, uh, greeny. Like we just, we just merge with greeny and greeny and I are one, and now I don't have to work with it. I don't have to do anything. And I it's not uncomfortable. It. It's not uncomfortable because now I have completely owned it. So now, if anybody doesn't like it, now they're saying they don't like me. What? So there's the bypass. And there's the bypass. There's the bypass. Right? I. This is just me. What you don't like me as I am. That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is right. And so you have a partner who maybe comes to you and says, "Well, I'm seeing behaviors." Or I'm feeling like there's a lot of jealousy present. And rather than saying, I don't feel any jealousy, the part this partner A says, well, I'm just a jealous person. You knew that. You knew that. Deal with it. Rather than saying, okay, what, what does this jealousy look like to you? Where, what are you seeing that looks like jealousy? Because again, jealousy is this complicated emotion made of other more basic and primal emotions like anger and fear and sadness and grief and anxiety and anticipatory grief and shame. And so someone else might actually have a better view of it than you do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Especially if you become identified. Because when we get grandiose, when we have totally identified with something, we, we're kind of flying high, even if it's something icky. 
right? Even if it's, a, if it's a negative quality, we identify with it and now we are unreachable, untouchable. We cannot be harmed. It's a really deeply protective strategy. It's also incredibly isolating. Um, it's painful for me to think about the times when I have done that. Not so much with jealousy, um, though some at the beginning, especially when we outlawed jealousy as a word. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't heard this story tell. before, you know, in our first triadic relationship, uh, yeah, our way of dealing with jealousy was to just say, no, 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 envy. And and we, we may be envious. We may, you know, want what someone else has, but we would never, ever, ever want to interrupt someone else's love bond, which is, of course, bullshit. Because... <laughs> Sometimes you want bad things. Because sometimes times, you want bad things. And sometimes I wanted to interrupt your relationship. Absolutely. And it wasn't necessarily the times that people might have imagined from the outside. Right. And my experience is that by saying that I wasn't acting out of jealousy, it allowed me to act out of jealousy. Right. It, and and do the a, things. I mean, I mentioned the manipulation earlier. That's exactly how I would go about doing things. I would manipulate the situation so that I didn't have to take responsibility for saying, I want this bad thing to happen. Yeah. And there's the thing. It, I mean, that's a it's a really basic technique <laughs> that um people, <laughs> all of us people, we've gotten really good at. Yeah. Um if you if you claim the thing right out loud, then you can't get blamed for it. Um, but jealousy and envy in particular, uh, most of us have. Well, we don't want to point fingers at each other, right? Like we're we're trying to be nice. Like in our relationships, we're we're doing some nice things. So if somebody says, "I'm not jealous," and then you see jealous behaviors, it can be really doubly hard to say, "Well." Okay, but I'm seeing that you're afraid of our of us being separated, and I'm seeing that you're acting kind of angry and petulant, and I'm seeing that you're struggling with a lot of anxiety, and you seem emotionally swamped and flooded. Isn't that maybe jealousy? And if the response is no, because I'm not jealous, or Yes, because I'm a jealous person. Either of those is protective. Either of those, yeah. Either, like there are so many ways we can deal with this, but I think that the the <laughs> the strategy of simply totally dismissing the word. I mean, that bought us like a year of just completely unconscious harm of, for for yeah. everybody in that relationship. Yep, a year of harm. Mm -hmm. So first off, let's just invite the word back in, the words jealousy, envy. And second, um, if you want to focus on your individuation, then there really is no emotional content that isn't potential individuation material. Well, this is one, this is why everything is talk about it for you. Yeah. Because you are pro-individuation. You are in favor of it. And for that to work as best it can. Everything is talkable. Right. And so if you're not ready to talk about jealousy with your partner yet, well, then who can you talk about it with? What, like, where can this fit? Um, and it should, before we finish this conversation, it should be said, we've been talking about it in the context of romantic partnerships, but jealousy turns up in any relationship where right. there's a valued other. It's spotted in infants as young as six months old. Hart and Carrington's research makes that clear, and there have been others since. And other species show some evidence of jealousy as well. So poodles definitely show oh jealousy. We yeah, just see poodle has got some serious jealousy issues. Um, but if we just think about the the that connection, that desired connection, yeah. it's really obvious. Any relationship that you care about deeply could be one where jealousy gets felt and so maybe you're not ready to work on jealousy or envy in your romantic partnership maybe you could start by working on it in a friendship or with um, a parent or with a child like we have these other beloved relationships where we are afraid of interruption or we have these these relationships where we find ourselves trapped in comparison and we're comparing ourselves great choose one that's not 
the most um, egregious, difficult right. option. Maybe start there because turning the, the lens on yourself is it's really tough at first. And I get that. And it really was for me. And it, it became enjoyable the same way other intensities became enjoyable over time. Yes, I'm talking about sex. Um, <laughs> it became enjoyable because I learned what it was for. And I didn't necessarily need to do that by jumping in the deep end. Now, I do tend to jump in the deep end of things, um, but it's okay to wade into the shallow end too. Yeah, absolutely. You took a slower entry mm -hmm. into that. I did. And, um, the way I do in most things. But, but here we are, yep. um, functionally doing a good job of participating in each other's separateness. And Which is not easy. It's not easy, but I've noticed. Uh, too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think so. We we started talking about jealousy as a source of individuation material, mm -hmm. and we have talked about jealousy. We've talked about a lot of things, and I think the reason that this hasn't been a real jealousy-heavy conversation is what we're saying about jealousy is true of any experience you care to name. Jealousy just gets a bad rap as an emotion, as something that we feel. Like culturally, we're supposed to hide it. We're supposed to not feel jealous. Like it's a source of shame. evil and shame and trouble. But we all feel it. And pretending we don't just causes more trouble. Right. And it blocks us from access to ourselves. And then on the flip side, over-normalizing it mm -hmm. leads us to endorsing jealousy, especially in monogamous relationships. Oh, you mean like um, all the, dating, the reality, movies and the songs and the shows right now. And you and I have watched a few doozies and, and I don't know why we watch them except, wow, it's a lot. And there are actually, there's data to show that people who watch a lot of these like high conflict, high jealousy inducing dating shows endorse um jealous behaviors as normal and useful mm. in relationships as a protective mechanism so yeah we could choose any emotional content that is considered shameful and turn it into individuation material and i mean i've got a lot more we can talk about with jealousy and envy we can talk about why the apa insists on calling it negative affect and we can talk about why the studies actually struggle. We, I struggle in my studies to find the, the, the answers to the questions because people tend to remember their negative responses to being jealous because we remember the, our big negative responses and right. we don't tend to remember our positive responses. Yeah. So <laughs> there's lots more to say. For now, how about if we leave it at this? Jealousy and envy are absolutely an option, an opportunity if you choose for it to be, to be part of your individuation journey. You don't have to pick it, but if you want to, it's there. It's there, and I am so here for it. <laughs> so um, if you enjoyed this episode, I would love to hear about it. We, you know, at Playing With Fire, we really just like, doubled down on talking about individuation and the initial response has been really, really positive. But if you're loving this, please take a moment to head over to iTunes. Even if you're listening on another platform, it would be great if you headed to iTunes right. and just rate it and review, drop some stars and let some of you know, uh, know about us. You know, we talk about non-monogamy and individuation, but what I'm hearing more and more from people is that Good non-monogamy information is good information for anybody who wants to level up their communication skills and their ability to just do relationships better. So I would love to have you pass the word along that Playing With Fire is here for you. And reach out to us. You can reach out to us um, at ken at joliehamilton.com because you're feeling these questions. See, yes, please. Concerns right now. And questions are welcome all the time. And thank you so much for listening, for being part of this, because my work is leveling up all the time because I'm getting a chance to have these conversations with you. And, and I love knowing that other people, yeah, that the listeners can um, 
can be part of it all. Thank you.